started. Um, welcome everybody, those of you that are here and those of you online. Um, this is our weekly uh, CHS Innovation Talks uh, brought to you by DISH. Um, this week we have our first of the spring anyways, uh, talk in the human performance focus area. Dr. Alicia Montalvo is, is gonna be talking to us today, ironically about heat. <laughs> and the risk reduction of pediatric heat-related illness broadly. Uh, her research background is very much focused on injury and epidemiology. Um, and thank you very much. I'll let you take it away from here. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I apologize if you hear my stomach growling through anything, and I'm so very excited to see that there are actually people in here because I was fully expecting to be talking to an empty room. Um, and also, I see people online, so that's amazing. Um, all right, let's get started. Oh, well, I guess the first thing I want to talk about is the title. I did change it a little bit because um, I did, I did, Jason asked me for a title and I was like, oh, I got to get him a title. So I just put something on, I send it over to him. And um, I put prevention in the title. And I personally am triggered by the word prevention as a cancer survivor because uh, prevention is a very victim blamey word. So I decided to change the title a little bit here today uh, for risk reduction because we're not really talking about prevention. We're talking about how we can mitigate risks in a changing climate. Get right past that. Uh, so first I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about background, like why I got interested in this topic. I'll give you a, um, a, climber, a, a primer on climate change. So I, I'm not an, uh, a climatologist, so I'm gonna do the best I can to bumble my way through it. Um, then I'll talk to you a little bit about safe, heat safety measures, and I'll finish up talking about current projects. And I, I apologize if this is a little bit disorganized. Um, I took like several different presentations and tried to put them together in a way that I felt made the most sense. So if I end up like jumping around or whatever, you know, bear with me here, we're, we're working through it. All right, so first about the background, I did my master's in public health a couple years ago, University of Arizona. Um, and I learned about this study in my infectious epidemiology class, infectious disease epidemiology class. And it's, um, I read this article about the spread of deer ticks in, in, in the United States. And we have to, there are actually very many threats to um, infectious disease because of changing climate. As warmer temperatures migrate northwards, we're going to see um, malaria, um, other diseases that are usually um, limited to tropical, subtropical, or maybe, I don't know what kind of climate you would uh, categorize deer ticks as living in, but this is all going to migrate northward. So you can see now that the biggest problem is probably like in the northeast, um, but as that, as it gets worse, it's going to continue to move further and further upward into Canada. And I found that really, really crazy and really interesting that they could apply these projection models uh, by, you know, put together the, the help with the, the climate to project into the future what things might look like in the changing climate. And I was doing some research on an injury called uh, rhabdomyolysis, which is an exercise induced type heat related injury in some cases. And there was like a rash of heat-related rhabdomyolysis cases in New Jersey, of all places, which is not a very hot place and not a place that you would expect to see that. And that kind of, kind of got me thinking, like, was this an unusually hot day in a place that's not typically hot? And maybe this is what caused this rash of um, very rare injuries. So this is how I got started on my, on my little journey. So let's talk a little bit about climate change. So my disclaimer, I am not a climatologist, so apologize if there are any weather people on here and I'm butchering things. Um, so climate change is gonna result in increased frequency, intensity, and duration of a variety of, a variety of um, weather related events. Here today, we're gonna be talking about heat, but um, I took this from another presentation that I did on climate change and health, and there are gonna be other problems with precipitation, drought, um, cyclones, all those sorts of things. Today we're going to be talking about heat. Um, and this is just an indication of how whether, uh, heat trends are going. So this is based on the global average surface temperature. And you can see in recent years, uh, since the post-industrial revolution, we've been having a lot of temperature increases. And actually, I think I was just reading an article, I think it was in the New York Times today or yesterday, that um, it's official that we have increased 1.5 degrees Celsius since pre-industrial um, times, pre-industrial revolution times. So you can see year over year, uh, it's on trend to continue getting warmer and warmer and warmer. 
Um, and so there are a couple different estimates out there. You can go on the conservative range or you can go on the more aggressive range of what climate change, what heat's going to look like into the future. But on the low end, 1.1, well, we're probably past the 1.1 at this point, and we're on trajectory to probably reaching that 5.1 degrees Celsius if, if we don't take action. Um, I just wanted to put this one in here to start um, laying the groundwork for how heat is going to change, how it's going to migrate over time. So this is a global picture of what it's going to look like. You can see, of course, we're going to get hotter in the middle, but where you see the biggest temperature changes occurring is further north. So we're going to see hotter temperatures, and we're going to see greater temperature swing or swings the further north you move, and then on the southern hemisphere, the further south you move. Um, and this becomes important when we're thinking about policy, not just here in Arizona, but, you know, are they going to have to have a heat policy in Montana or in Alaska or, you know, different parts of Canada? Um, so the, like I said, in zero to 30, so that's between the equator and uh, 30 degrees would be just maybe north of Florida, some of Texas, uh, subtropical, we're going to see the greatest swings in temperature, but it's just going to be that prolonged exposure to heat. So those summers of um, you know, 10, 20 days over 120 degrees, nighttime temperatures staying extremely high, just more of that. Um, as we move further northward, we're going to see moderate temperature swings, but just more exposure to heat, right? It's just going to get hotter. And then as we get further up, we're going to see those greatest temperature swings where um, the, the people are just not prepared. The infrastructure is not prepared to absorb that kind of increase in heat. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens over time. You already see a lot of studies coming out from Europe. Um, about these heat waves and what it's doing to the people because of the infrastructure and their inability to kind of absorb that, um, handle the um, handle the impact of that heat. I just wanted to throw up here an image of what it looks like. So right now we've got um, probably most of Texas and Florida affected by that 30 degrees. So that's where we're going to see it's going to be hotter. We're kind of close to that 30 degrees here in, in Arizona. So um, we probably will experience some of the same things that they're seeing that in that third, you know, zero to 30 degrees. And then most of the rest of the United States is in that moderate range. Um, here are some um, climate models that I just wanted to share. So this one's a past one. I think I can't really see this yet from 2005. So this is, I took this from a website that just um, models uh, projections for you. Um, if you wanted to do like um, conservative, moderate or aggressive um, based on changes that you wanna see, and it will map out those changes for you. So this is just, a model of, I can't, uh, can't see this, from um, 1986 to 2005, the averages. And you can see we've got hot spots here in Arizona, here in Southern Texas, so some in Southern, in Southern Florida. So now um, I'm just gonna scroll through so you can see the changes over time, the projected changes over time. And I chose a moderate model. I didn't choose an aggressive one and I didn't choose a conservative one, I just chose a moderate one. So you can, you here you can see that that orange is migrating up northwards and it's getting kind of like lighter at the top. And this is a projection from 2020 to 2039. Then from 2040 to 2059, you start seeing it to get kind of really dangerous in places maybe that it hasn't been as dangerous before. Plus it's getting uh, warmer further north. And then here we're starting to see some really hot temperatures towards the end of the century in places that are not used to seeing those sorts of temperatures. So just to give you an idea of that, what that impact is gonna look like. Um, something else I wanted to touch on was the urban heat island effects. Urban heat island effects is something that's experienced in, in cities where the built environment kind of absorbs and retains the heat and emits it back out um, at times during the day or during the night. Um, and uh, so in rural areas, you get less of an impact of the urban heat island effects because you know you've got the grass and the trees and the and nature that kind of um, mitigate the impacts of the heat, whereas the concrete, the buildings, the cement absorb, retain, and then just like emit emanate heat. Um, and then here I give you a little image of, of what it looks like in different types of built environments. Um, uh, in this website, I saw that it said that um, Phoenix experiences eight degrees increase in exposure with a more built environment. So um, in the cities relative to the more, you know, rural or suburban areas outside, people are experiencing daytime and nighttime temperatures that are eight degrees above what other people are experiencing. So uh, it gives you an idea of um, how cities um, and certain areas that have less access to green space might be disproportionately impacted by the, uh, by the impacts. 
Um, and here, I just wanted to give you a little image of what the urban heat islands look like. Actually, eight degrees is um, moderate, like it's a lot, but it's not as much as other cities experience. So in New York, LA, um, other larger cities, and I'm sure as Phoenix continues to grow, our number, uh, our degrees will probably continue to rise. But in other much more built environments, the, the problem is much worse. Uh, so a few of the things that influence um, uh, help, health with the heat. So we've got hot nights. You know, you've got these hot nights where you've got hot days and then you're like, okay, it's going to cool down at night and I'll get some relief. Well, not so much because I know here personally um, in the summer, I'm working out at 100 degrees uh, at 8 o'clock at night, 100, 106 degrees as I work out outside with my husband. And it's still very, very, very hot at night. So um, consecutive nights are kind of predictive of morbidity and mortality. So the intensity of the heat waves, um, so hotter days uh, um, are going to cause more uh, hospitalization for all cause, not just heat related. Then we've got the urban heat islands effect. So if we're living in a built environment, let's say we're living in downtown Phoenix and it's a heat wave with very hot days, very intense heat um, and nights where we're not getting a lot of relief, we're probably at increased risk of different, you know, not just heat illness, but other things too. And then there's individual risk factors. And these are the ones that I'm kind of more interested in because I'm more interested, I'm an athletic trainer. So my interests are about, um, helping people become and remain physically active. Um, how can we do, reduce injury risk to people or how to, can we mitigate injury risk to people? So fitness is a big part. If you're not fit and you try to go do exercise on a really hot day during a heat wave, you're gonna be in trouble. Um, if you're obese, if you got like a, a large body size, you're gonna be in trouble. If you've got some other risk factors, smoking, some medication use, uh, if you're using equipment, if you're not well hydrated, you could be at risk, not just of heat illness, but of other heat related morbidity and mortality. Um, and the final topic that I wanted to address was the uh, social determinants of health. There are major ra racial and ethnic disparities uh, along with socioeconomic disparities in um, heat related morbidity and mortality. And there are more questions. I have a lot of questions about heat uh, related morbidity and mortality on exertional heat illness in high school athletes, youth athletes, children, because this is not a very well-studied area. But we have to also consider the social determinants of health. Uh, I mentioned about the urban heat islands effects, and um, you can see here that one of the social determinants of health is the neighborhood and the built environment. Um, there are discriminatory, discriminatory housing lend, uh, lending practices that occurred in the past, and that pushed people, uh, minorities, into certain neighborhoods that left in with, without access to green spaces or with um, an inferior built environment in some ways that put them maybe at greater risk. Um, maybe they're living in um, housing that doesn't have access to air conditioning. You know, this is, becomes more of like a, an economic stability thing. Do they have the ability to air condition their homes? Do they have access? If it's broken, can they fix it? Um, I just wanted to pull up this one here. You can see housing characteristics. So. Um, if you're living in, for example, uh, Pope Mosley is doing a lot of work on um, like mobile home. Mobile. Uh -oh. Did I put the machine no, complete? 30 minutes. Top of the We are uh, experiencing we technical are. difficulties here. Shut up. The screen is like, get me out of here. I'm too bored. Yeah. <laughs> the slide is still up. Okay, so should I just keep going? Let's just let them know. Yeah. On your PC. No problem. Uh, yeah, so housing characteristics, like are they living in a mobile home, something like that? Uh, do they have access to air conditioning or do they have the ability to fix their air conditioning? Um, are they sleeping with their windows open? Do they have use, uh, do they have the access to public cooling spaces? So here we have cooling centers, but in other places, maybe could, could they access the mall or a Target, for example? Um, and then of course, the urban heat island effect. 
and it, it, it disproportionately impacts people of color and people of lower socioeconomic status. Yeah, so I just wanted to note here that um, heat-related morbidity mortality is worse in Hispanic, Black, and Native American relative to white individuals. And we've got, um, it's worse with lower socioeconomic status. All right, now I wanna talk a little bit about heat safety guidelines. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about heat index. Um, this is probably the one that's most widely used here, um, but it's got a few limitations and I wanna talk about those really briefly. Uh, the first limitation that I see, especially in its application to children, is that it's based on like the body size of an adult male. Um, the second part is that it assumes moderate physical activity. So if you've got a child doing vigorous activity in the heat, is this an appropriate model to use? Um, and then the worst part is that it underestimates heat in dry, sunny climates with low humidity. Um, I know they, they do have like um, a variation of the heat index that's specifically for hotter and dry climates, but that's just, you know, these are some things that we need to consider. Is this the best tool that we can use to make um, decisions, evidence-based decisions? Um, and this current and the other one that's uh, most commonly used in my field is a wet bulb globe thermometer, wet bulb globe index. Um, and this is a picture of a kestrel. You'll take that out onto your field. You'll take your measurement before practice and make a determination about whether or not it's safe to continue play on a specific day. But of course, this one also has many limitations. Um, I do want to get on my soapbox for a second. That wet bulb globe thermometer was developed in um, a military base in Paris Island, South Carolina. Um, and maybe the 50s or the 60s. So you're talking about military recruits, healthy um, 18, 19, 20 year old males, probably white males. Um, and they're making determined, you know, they probably they saw this issue of people are going down. It seems to be related to the heat. They developed this index and that's who it's based on. And that's where it's based on, right? So uh, a coastal humid climate in the South with a very homogenous population that we're then taking to Arizona and trying to make decisions about play for children. Um, most appropriate, best thing we have right now, probably most appropriate, probably not, but it does, a, does not do a great job um, with low humidity, with a higher wind speed or with higher temperatures. We've got low humidity here and we've got high temperatures here. So probably some better tools we can use. It's prone to measurement error, obviously, because you're using, you're going out there with a piece of equipment, taking the measurement yourself. And anecdotally, in my field, I have found that um, here in Arizona, it's a little bit different because the state um, high school association of like athletics kind of gifted um, kestrels to many of the athletic trainers in the schools here. But um, anecdotally, I have heard from many people that they are using apps to make these decisions about what bulb glow thermometer and whether or not to play. And that's a problem because if you're not using the tool, um, you're probably not gonna make the right decisions. And temperature, these measures are very like location specific. So if you're making the decision with your phone and you're not taking into account the fact that you're playing on a turf where the surface might be a little bit hotter, um, you know, you're, you're, talk, you're potentially making a problem for yourself or somebody else. Um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about heat acclimatization guidelines, not too much, just that they exist for the most part. Um, so there are policies in, in schools and in states that uh, they can adopt that dictate um, how to grade entry into play in hot conditions. Because oftentimes, um, you know, kids will be sitting on their butts, um, comes June, July, August, and preseason starts, they're completely out of shape. It's very hot outside, and now they're being expected to practice maybe two a days. Um, so that's actually not the right decision to make. You have to grade physical activity gradually, allow, um, allow them to acclimatize. Um, here are the more specific things that are recommended to do. Um, and something that's important to note is that these state mandated, mandated guidelines, which are not adopted, they're not widely adopted. They have been shown to reduce risk of exertional heat illness in, in high school football players by 50%. That's a huge, huge reduction in risk just through making sure you're following best practices. Um, and so what I wanted to show you here, these are the activity modification guidelines based on whatever the wet bulb globe temperature is for a given day. And what you can see here is that they're very generic. They're like, okay, well, um, if the wet bulb globe is this, uh, restrict play. If it's this, you're full to go or whatever. You make decisions based on this. But what we know about these temperatures is that they're very local. So um, uh, one of my colleagues did a, a study to look at uh, heat-related mortality in um, high school athletes. 
And so you can see here that these are really, um, the larger circles indicate like uh, the, um, the temperature. Um, and you can see the, the, the depths are kind of clustered in this region, right? So the Southeast um, through this Valley, Arizona into Southern California. Um, and you can see these darker regions. We've got uh, region three is what's the, they just broke out these guidelines into different regions because they're noticed, okay, well, uh, different people living in different parts of the country respond, are gonna respond differently to different temperatures because there's local components to the, to the, the heat. And something that I, uh, okay, so in region one, we've got the Pacific coast, New England, Northern US, and the cut point there is 29 degrees Celsius. When we move a, a little bit further north, the cut point is 31 degrees Celsius. And then the cut point a little bit further south is 32 degrees Celsius or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And what I wanted to remind you about is changing of the heat, right? So we're gonna, so we have this now, what's it gonna look like in a few years? We're here now, and then it's gonna get hotter further north and then it's gonna get a holler further, further north, right? So those are our guidelines right now, but I think this is showing that we probably need to have a more dynamic and flexible approach to how we're making these decisions, maybe more hyper-local approaches to making these evidence-based decisions. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the current projects and I'm put them in the order that I felt made the most sense. Um, the first project that I'm working on, I've got a grant that I'm preparing for April, is comparing the heat index to a new product by the National Weather Service called the Heat Risk. Um, we're going to try to predict heat illness in school children. Um, my team is Andy Grunstein at University of Georgia. We're working with Tom Preeters from the National Weather Service and um, my colleague, who's a policy expert, Sam Scardeo Miller out of West Virginia University. Um, and we were doing some digging, trying to figure out what our next project was going to be. And we're looking at uh, guidelines for outdoor activity for children. And what we found was that there's no state policy. There are uh, the county public health department did put out um, recommendations and those are based on the heat index. And then the school administrators, I used to get emails from my daughter's principal saying the heat index is high today. So we're gonna keep the, the kids inside. So it's actually the principal <laughs> who's got absolutely no training in this sort of stuff. Well, that, that I know, maybe he does have training in it. Um, making the decisions about whether or not the kids are going to be going outside to play today, which is kind of completely crazy when you think about it. Um, and around that same time that we were talking about it, I saw this. I'm, I'm just like obsessed with Reddit. I just can't get enough. I know some people are like really into Twitter. I just love Reddit. You'll, I can't stop scrolling. So um, yeah, I saw this post on Reddit, which was, uh, you see her on the left hand side. They thought like, did somebody bring drugs into school? The kids were like vomiting and blah, 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 blah. And then everybody's like jumping on saying, actually, no, it's, this was five months ago. So what month was that? It's uh, maybe yeah. August or September or something like that. Um, so everybody's jumping in is actually, that's like heat stroke actually, that they're actually dying of heat right now. Um, so yeah, somebody thought it was drugs and they had to, but this is, these are the things that will happen when you've got people making decisions that maybe, maybe they, there could be better decisions made. All right. So I just wanted to remind you the limitations of the heat index are based on adults, right? Not on children and on moderate physical activity. So you're talking August uh, with young children going completely bananas on a playground when heat is really hot. So this is the perfect storm for um, that Reddit post. Um, so the, the Nat National Weather Service is working on this new, uh, they're calling it the heat risk prototype. Um, and so, yeah, so we reached out to Tom with this concern and he told us, oh, we're actually working on this. And so this is the product that they're working on. It is, it's customized to location, which you're gonna see, I think things need to get way more local. Um, and it's based on unusual heat, right? So is it hotter than we're expecting it to be? Um, how long has it been hot? And what are the health risks associated with all of that, right? So <clears throat> whereas um, the heat indexes, they're giving you uh, recommendations, but they're not laying them out for specific groups of people. Here you can see that they're laying it out for specific groups of people. So they're considering vulnerable populations. You've got them talking about uh, people who are um, not properly hydrated, sensitive to the heat, especially not with effective cooling, right? So access to things, talk, thinking about the social determinants of health, kind of bringing in the more individual risk factors into the model. Um, so yeah, 
how are we going to do this? Well, uh, I got an estimate for the Center for Health Informatic, uh, Information Research. Um, we're going to try to use the data set that they have, uh, just uh, um, take out the cases of children 18 and under. We're going to link the, that data to climate variables um, to calculate the heat risk and the heat index. Um, and then we're going to compare, right, who did a better job of predicting, you know, how many cases there were on days of a high heat index versus days of a high heat risk. Um, and we're going to use that information then to inform policies. Can it be used to inform National Weather Service policy? Can it be used to inform school policy? Can we take this to the county health department? Do we need to go uh, the legislation route? Um, I don't know. Let's see. <clears throat> um, so yeah, the ultimate goal of this project is to develop data-driven injury reduction uh, risk reduction policies. Because I feel at this point, we're using tools, but the tools are they the best tools that we can be using and are they are they really are they really data driven are they really the best evidence tools that we have uh the next project we're working on <clears throat> current and predicted risks of exertional heat illness in youth athletes uh this one's a grant that i just finished the other day it's a resubmission going to the national athletic trainers association it was pretty highly scored and i expect to get it for this resubmission um, my team is perry highstead he is an environmental and occupational health uh, epidemiol and, uh, an environmental climate, climate, climate epidemiologist at Oregon State University, um, my colleague Zach Kerr at the UNC Injury Prevention Center, and again, Sam Scarneo Miller, who's a policy expert. And um, the main problem here is that heat illness is a leading cause of de death and disability in children. Um, the only thing that causes more, or in, in youth athletes, the only thing that causes more death, I guess, would be um, sudden cardiac death. So I mentioned earlier, there are different types of policies that people, uh, that states or schools can adopt. Um, and uh, this is uh, information about state, state level compliance with heat acclimatization guidelines, heat safety policies. Um, only five states out of 51, including DC, fully comply. Uh, 43 comply partially, and then we've got a couple states that don't comply at all with these heat safety guidelines. And as you remember, there's a 50% reduction when you just do heat acclimatization uh, procedures alone. Um, and the premise here is that ambient heat, I know this is like, this really got me at first, like I couldn't understand what my own, <laughs> what I was trying to say, that ambient heat is associated with heat stroke, um, traumatic injury, and acute work-related injury in other populations. So this means that um, as temperature rises, there's a correlation between that temperature rising and uh, the incidence of, of these other things, right? And I know it sounds like, why would you need to prove that? But actually, you do need to put numbers to these things before you can start doing other things. So that's what we're going to be doing. What I want to talk about a little bit first is um, the study that was done in Japan, looking at cases of um, exertional or of heat stroke. And they found, obviously, there was an association between heat and heat stroke. And the most interesting, interesting things that I found here um, are that 66% of the cases were in the age of uh, uh, in, in younger age groups were exercise induced. And this is exactly the problem right here, right? So if you're trying to protect young people doing exercise in the heat, these are the people who are at greatest risk. Um, and also minimum heat, min uh, minimum temperature. So the maximum daily temperature and whatever the minimum daily uh, temperature was at night. So if it remained hot at night, you're also being associated with um, exertional heat stroke. And I think what this shows is that it's like more of a prolonged exposure to heat, right? It's not like necessarily a one day. It could be like a series of days leading up and, and that's how the, the risk is increased. Um, so in, in a few other studies, that one was done specifically on heat stroke in a population, the, the Japanese population, um, a city. Um, but there were other studies done. So you can see in outdoor agricultural workers, this is also a problem. And the thing that gets me the most about this one is that the, it's the strongest associations were in June and July, which is exactly what preseason is for high school athletes here in Arizona specifically. Um, well, I think, yeah, June, July. Um, and then we've got a 1% increase in the odds of acute work-related injury. So we're not just talking about heat-related injury. We're talking about other types of accidents in people younger than 25, right, with each degree increase in the minimum daily temperature. So we're not just talking about heat-related injury that we could address through these other measures. We, we could actually probably decrease risk of other musculoskeletal injuries and other accidents. So the questions in this research, well, first is, is heat associated with um, 
heat illness in youth athletes. Um, and then uh, a further extension of that is like kind of doing a curve to see if there's a threshold that exists. Um, the second part of this, we're gonna be looking at um, racial and ethnic disparities at the community level. Is, is it an effect measure modifier? Um, does it differ depending on what the community uh, composition looks like? And then the third part is gonna be, um, we're gonna apply that climate projection that I showed you for the deer ticks, um, 2030, 2050 to 2100, to see what's it gonna look like over time. And we're gonna also integrate policy for those states that are complying, for states that are not complying and for everybody in between. How is that policy gonna impact what rates are gonna look like over time? So what are we doing? We're using a database called the High School Reporting Information Online. Um, this is done through Dataless, uh, which is like a, it's a data warehouse for sport injury. Um, the High School Reporting Information Online is uh, basically it's a medical record that schools use, and then they can use that medical record for free, and all of the data gets sent to the database. Um, so that's how we're, we're identifying cases. We're going to link those cases, same thing link cases to the zip code um, for the date um, and the location to get the climate variables linked in there. Um, we're gonna use a stratified case crossover design um, to look at the association and also to look at um, race and ethnicity community composition as a, an effect measure modifier. And then on that third part, we're gonna apply the projections 2030, 2050 to 2100 to see what it's gonna look like over time. Um, and of course, we hope to get thresholds for this but also I see this as a way to slap down some data in front of a policymaker to say, you're not complying. You got to do something. Look, look what's going to happen if you don't do anything. Um, the variables of interest here are going to be temperature, humidity, solar radiation, wind speed. I think we will be doing some wet bulb globe thermometer calculations. Um, and the environmental factors of interest, of course, we're looking at um, community green space for the urban heat island effect community racial and ethnic composition using the American Community Survey. Um, we'll also do a socioeconomic index in order to control for poverty um, measures of socioeconomic status. And we'll be using something called the Justice 40, um, either yes or no. Uh, Justice 40 is a project from the US Department of Transportation. Um, they're, I, get, I guess they're giving grants to um, communities to improve their infrastructure to be more resilient in the face of increasing temperatures. And our goal here, again, this time, it's to be making more equitable data-driven guidelines. Because I think right now, if we're not even measuring, like in the medical record, it's not even an option to select race. So if you're not measuring it, you don't even know how bad the problem is. So maybe I will. <laughs> I don't know if the woman who won, runs that database is going to be very open to me running to her, asking her to add race in there. But uh, maybe it's something that I just need to uh, become brave enough to go do. But yeah, I'm very concerned about these policies not being equitable. And I'm worried that um, there are other issues in sports medicine. For example, sudden cardiac death is the problem is bigger in, um, in black high school and youth athletes than it is in white high school athletes. So um, is that something that's happening here too? Um, is cardiac death even, maybe it's related to heat. I wouldn't be surprised if cardiac death was related to heat. Um, and the third project that we're working on, let's see. No, this is actually the project that I'm working on right now. So this is predicting risk of exertional heat illness in children using big environmental data and machine learning. And this is like, this is my one that I'm like, oh, this is a good one. I like it so much. My chef's kiss. Um, I'm working with Hassan here in biomedical informatics. Um, Erin Ann Saffel, she's a state climatologist, and Jeff Comp over at Valleywise. He's an emergency department physician. And here are the ideas that children under the age of 18 are at greatest risk of exertional heat illness. So um, let's look at it. Again, I wanted to remind you of the limitations of the wet bulb globe index. That's what we're currently using. I think that we can do better. Um, here, uh, this is like my favorite study of all time. So this is a study on a population in Japan where they took the population data on um, heat, heat illness heat stroke, and they associated with, with heat, um, and they use machine learning. So I like to think of machine learning, um, AI as like uh, statistics on steroids. Here you can see on the top, I think we're really limited in what we can do with our, with our traditional statistics. Um, you see they use GLM on the top with wet bulb globe thermometer only. So they're using wet bulb globe thermometer to determine how accurate it is. 
Um, looks like they, you could see um, across the board on the top here, you see the spikes when the heat gets really high, it's not doing a good job of capturing the cases. Um, so they applied a few different machine learning techniques to the data, and they came up with this uh, GAM and undersampling XG boost. And you can see now when they apply the machine learning, how well the predictive, the model predicts cases. Um, so I was really interested in this and I thought, hey, maybe we can do this in Phoenix. So can a machine learning approach outperform um, the gold standard for predicting heat illness? So yeah, can we maybe replace the uh, wet bulb glow thermometer with a machine learning algorithm? I, I will say I do love AI. I am concerned it's gonna come murder us. So I do, I do worry about that. But in the meantime, let's try to use it to, you know, help. Um, so what is the approach? We're, well, we already identified cases from the last 10 years in Valleywise Health. I have the data set. I'm working right now with some BMI students to link that, um, to link the uh, variables of interest to the data. So we're working on these climate linkages right now. Um, don't ask me about the machine learning approach. I don't know if Hassan is on here because I cannot answer any questions about that. Uh, we'll be applying a convolutional neural networks approach. Um, and then we're going to compare kind of the same thing that I just showed you in the other slide. We're going to compare how, do, how well does wet bulb gold thermometer do and how well does um, the machine learning approach do. Uh, well, what are the variables that we're going to include in the model? Temperature, humidity, solar radiation, wind speed, cloud cover, precipitation, all of these things that we know influence temperature. Um, we're going to be looking at environmental factors also because we've got to control for that. How much access to green space? Uh, what is the community racial composition, community income composition? So again, measures from the com uh, American Community Survey from the U.S. Census Bureau. And then we're going to take whatever measures, individual measures we can from the, um, the medical records. Uh, they're not as clean as I would like, but they're not for data, right? So they're not they're not for data, they're not for research. So we're we're doing the best we can with them. I think what we're gonna be able to do right now is age, sex, and body size. And then again, our goal here is to develop equitable data-driven injury risk reduction guidelines um, for children who are engaged in outdoor activity in the heat. I think we can just do better. So what is the take home point? I put Ollie up here, it's gonna rain. Uh, well, it's gonna be hot. And so I think that we can leverage technology to do a better job, to create these guidelines, to create, to, to create policies, um, to help people become and remain physically active. I mean, that's, that's my number one goal is how can we get people exercising, continuing to exercise. And um, if they're getting injured or if it's too hot outside or whatever, as, as it's like pouring and freezing yeah. outside. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that's a, that's the ultimate goal. All right, I'm always up to collapse, so look out. Um, any questions? Um, yeah, hi, this is uh, David Sklar, and um, yeah, thanks for uh, putting the spotlight on children. Um, one thing, I actually asked the uh, folks over at Children's Hospital how many children they saw over the last summer that uh, were experiencing heat-related uh, illness. And the number was actually pretty small. And I also looked at the death numbers from children under four or five, and I believe there was zero, compared to the adults where we had over 600. And I'm wondering what you think about that. You know, I, it seems to me that maybe children are just getting better taken care of, you know, having more um, you know, more uh, protection and getting them out of dangerous environments. Of course, a lot of the adults we saw had uh, meth and fentanyl, and I'm assuming the children don't have that. But, yeah, you know, I, I still think it's really important to identify the kids who are at risk for exercise. But what do you think as far as the fact that there weren't, you know, the number of deaths and um, severe illness, at least at the children's hospital? Yeah, there's no doubt that it's a bigger problem in adults than, there, than it is in children. There's no doubt about that. Um, in terms of um, Valleywise versus, are you asking in terms of Valleywise versus Phoenix children or just? Well, you know, Phoenix children, uh, Phoenix children, I think probably sees more children than Valleywise. Valleywise, we do see kids, but um, not to the extent that, uh, you know, Children's Hospital probably does. And that's why we tried to find out how many kids they actually had who yeah. had, I think that we were looking at temperatures over 106 
And there were about three over the summer, which was not anywhere near as many as I thought there would be. Whereas, as I say, at, at uh, Valley Wise for the adults, we had, I think, over 50. Yeah. So anyway, just, just wondering what you think. Yeah, maybe my th first thought would be, you know, what, who are the people that Phoenix Children serves? Yeah, they serve more people, do, but do they serve more people with health insurance? Do they, how many people do they serve without health insurance? Um, my second thought would be like, yeah, maybe the message is getting out to protect children more. I know that the athletic trainers in the community do a really great job of making sure that the students, the student athletes are staying safe. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know really what else to say. <laughs> well, no, it'll be interesting to see what data, what you get out of the data from Valley Wise, if that's similar or different. We've got um, plenty of cases out of Valley Wise, but we I, did use 10 years of data, so. Yeah, I, I will tell you, trying to look at the adult data, which we tried to do, um, unfortunately, the medical records, um, there's not um, a great accuracy yeah. as far as um, the uh, you know hypothermia or heat stroke when you look at those. So maybe in kids it'll be better, but yeah, it was it was a little disappointing. Maybe they are maybe they're taking care of it at home. You know, it's less severe. They're catching it ahead of time. Um, but it would be interesting to look at the numbers numbers from the county health department where they do the surveillance um, in yeah. general, right? So not just the from the Phoenix children are not just from Valley Wise, but from all the cases. In but the certainly, county. if you look at the if you look at the deaths, the deaths were pretty. I mean, I think it was zero under four, which at least means I, I guess there weren't any kids left in cars, you know, who got uh, killed from that. But um, at least that's nice that there weren't any deaths that they identified. Yeah, we uh, just did the distributions on the Valley Wise data by age and was surprised to see that, well, not that surprised to see, but way, way higher numbers for zero, one, two years old. That's where the, the, the curve goes like this, zero, one to two, and then it comes up and then it starts going up again at 14, 15, 16, which is what you would expect because mm -hmm. those are the high school athletes. But it was very, very pronounced for zero, one, and two. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. A lot in the, the a lot of support in the high school setting, right? With athletic trainers, but you have so many kids playing club sports. Oh yeah. Absolutely no regulation whatsoever. I think that it's getting. I think that it's becoming more popular to have an athletic trainer. There's a lot of like um, um, per diem type groups. Cause you know, I don't know what they call them. Um, like you can get them from the hospital. There are people who have private companies where they can come and staff your your uh, event for you but then again who what are the policies within the club you know does the club even want to have a policy does the club care to have a policy should the field have a policy um i don't know i don't know what the answer is how successful has the mata been at, at getting policy um so five states comply <laughs> so is that coming from the nata um the stat um I think a lot of it comes from the NATA, and you can see the states where they have it are states where uh, states with the highest compliance. I was looking at them just the other day. Are the states where there are researchers who are heavily involved in this type of research, who have clearly been doing the work to push for the policy? Um, and I think that states, in some cases, are very resistant to these types of policies. Um, I I don't know if there's a political nature to it. I don't I don't know what the what the case may be. It could just just also be that there's nobody pushing for it, right? Because you need to have the money to lobby for it. You need to know how to do it. You need to know the right people. It's just a kind of kind of like a combination of things. It's a hard thing to do. You got to be motivated, um, and maybe there's some pushback. Wonder and uh, children's zero to two years old. Before you continue, I want to remind you that you told me you weren't going to ask any questions. <laughs> when do you ever trust me? <laughs> Can't help it. Um, you know, it makes me think of the parents who leave their kids in the car, even when it's not that hot mm -hmm. outside, but it gets hot mm -hmm. in the car. And then I've heard from a teacher or a school administrator, I should say, a private school that my kids go to that parents, you know, in the car seats, they have their little one in the car seat and then put the cloth over oh my it. God. The thinking they're protecting them yeah. with shade, but the heat in there. Yeah. Burns, um, so 
anyways, makes me think because at that age, the kids don't go to public schools. So the parents need to be educated. And that makes me think of hospitals where they, when you, you know, your child is born, they make you watch a video, don't shake your baby. We need a video uh, about a heat illness. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, babies especially have, they can't talk. They can't express what their needs are other than yeah. crying. Um, and they don't have great temper, you know, temperature regulation improves with age um, uh, to, to an extent. So yeah, I mean, they will literally let every anyone have a kid. They let me have three. So I don't, maybe maybe there needs to be more education about it, especially after looking at that value wise data. I was like, yeah. wow, that's something serious. I mean, serious. through the government pathway, you can get schools to comply, but what do you do about private schools, mm -hmm. parents? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a challenge with policy is like, okay, you can have the policy, but how do you enforce the policy? I do, yeah. um, so, okay, you make the policy, the the personnel don't comply, somebody gets hurt or dies, do you prosecute? Like what, what is it? Is it a guideline? What, what do you do? I don't know. I think you have a better question in the chat. I'm just typing, you just type in. How do we no, but there was a question about Nada getting compliance. I'm just following various rules. <laughs> I have a question. Is there any research on like certain, I know you said like certain body types potentially have certain impacts. So my daughter's a little redhead. The moment oh. I go outside, she's pink. So we have a very big rule in summertime. Like we really limit her outdoor activity. Um, so is there any research around like redheads potentially? I, I don't know about like uh, <laughs> uh, skin color, for example, but like more body fat, you know, if you have a larger body size, more body fat, you're retaining more heat, um, you're producing more heat. Um, those are the kinds of things that put you at greater risk, right? So um, in the context of sports, I think like an offensive lineman, a very large, out of shape, maybe overweight, person with lots of heavy equipment on, a helmet on, doing sprints in preseason on a very hot day after very many hot nights going home somewhere. Maybe they don't have air conditioning at night. I mean, that's the kind of thing I think about is like maybe not one, but an interaction of things. So even if she's fair, is she going home to somewhere with air conditioning? Is she properly hydrated? Um, it's it's not like a uh, it's a multifactorial problem. Is there any truth you'll hear people say like Arizonans have thin blood because we live in it? Like, is there any truth to like people in hotter climates having thinner blood versus those in colder having thicker blood? Yeah, I don't think it's thinner blood. I think it's acclimatization. So you know you have those heat acclimatization guidelines um, to get people ready to participate in the heat. And really, what you have here in Arizona is just people living in heat. And so we're naturally acclimatized. Just like if I go move to Denver or Flagstaff, I'm going to get more red blood cell or, you know, a greater oxygen saturate. You know, my body will compensate for the lower oxygen in the atmosphere. Just like my body will compensate for living in um, a hotter climate, I guess up until a certain point, then we'll just all start to die. <laughs> Probably acclimatization is to greater blood volume and greater sweat rate. Mm -hmm. Any other questions in the chat? Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Before you sign on, yeah. one more talk, I think, right? Next week, yeah. we've got Professor Marco Santello who's going to be joining us. I don't know if we have that. I don't think I saw it. Not next week, so it's a health talk next week. Oh, two weeks from now. So the 22nd. So two weeks. <laughs> See you again. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.